Let me introduce a little bit uh, about uh, the speaker today. Uh, then I will hand over the floor to them. Uh, the, today's talk uh, will be uh, given by Alicia Lavano and uh, Genevieve Lyons. Alicia got her uh, master's degree in biostatistics from Drexel University. She's the associate director of the Center for Biostatistics and Health Science, her health data science at Virginia Tech. She published uh, broadly, including sleep, cardiovascular disease, breast cancer, uh, youth wellness, and the social determinants of the health. Her expertise in the database management and the survey development, particularly with RedCap and uh, Quartric. And she's a fluent in SAS and uh, R. And she also uh, has effort for preparing the grant application. Her research interests in mental health, diversity, equal, uh, equity, and inclusion, and the experimental study design. Next slide, please. Genevieve, uh, is, uh, Genevieve is our uh, staff biostatistician at UVA, Department of Health, Public Health Sciences. She got her biostatistical uh, master degree in biostatistics statistics from the University of South Carolina. She is the uh, program manager at the, the ISRIVE Research Call. She has uh, published in Cancer Research, Maternal Health, and uh, Nephrology, Cardiology, uh, Patient Physician Interaction, and uh, others. Her research interests uh, include um, in statistical education, community and the communication, approach to a reproducible uh, code and effective data visualization. Before I give the, uh, the floor to uh, Genevieve and Alicia, I will uh, make an announcement about uh, the next talk about uh, research reproducibility. The speaker will be uh, Marco Jones, she is a research data scientist at UVA Health Science Library. Her talk, uh, the title would be Working Smart and Not Hard, Reproducible Data, uh, data Analysis with R Markdown. The next talk will be on the April 29th at the same time. The registration link is also available. Uh, here. Now, without further ado, I will give the floor to Genevieve and Alicia. Genevieve. Thanks for that introduction, Jenny. Thank you, Jenny. Uh, welcome to our talk. Today, we're going to talk about, um, about planning and organizing your research. Um, we, we feel that good research grows from columns and rows, and so we want to help you plant the seeds of success. So first we're going to, I want to ask um, all of you, the audience, a few questions. Um, I've got some cool questions here. First of all, we're interested in knowing what um, statistical pa packages that you primarily use. So please let us know uh, right now by clicking in the poll. All right, it looks like most of you have had a chance to answer, so I'm going to share the results. Um, and it looks like we've got some SAS users, maybe the majority of you are using our studio. We've got some Stata and SPSS as well, and GraphCAD. Um, it's a good all spread. right. Yeah, good spread. Yeah. And we've got one more question, which is going to be what types of analyses that you do. Um, so you can feel free to answer this one now too. And you can also, you can check more than one since probably you do most of these.
All right, I'm gonna go ahead and share those results. So it looks like everybody does t-tests. We've got a lot of descriptive statistics going on, data visualizations, and then some regression. Very nice. All right. Cool. So the first thing that we're gonna talk about is what is the reason that you're collecting your data? Um, so the reason that pretty much that almost all of us are collecting data is to answer a research question that is addressing a specific hypothesis. And your data is crucial to the process. So thinking through all of these details will really pay off in the long run. Um, so best practice number one is to think about what your planned analysis is going to be. You're going to um, identify what is the outcome variable that's gonna answer your research question. Think about the way that you're going to measure it. Is it a continuous variable or is it a binary variable? Or maybe it's another kind of variable. Once you've identified this, you've automatically narrowed down the appropriate analyses. For example, you can't do a logistic regression on a continuous variable. And then next you'll want to think about how are you going to execute these analyses in your statistical software. You're gonna think about your, your proc or the R package or the tool that you're gonna use in PRISM. And so whatever you choose, you're gonna need your data to be structured in a certain way in order for it to work. So let's start with some quick background information just to make sure that we're all kind of on the same page with our terminology. Um, so, um, as so we've sort of already alluded to this, but data is usually arranged in rows and columns in kind of a spreadsheet formation. Um, when we talk about the unit or the level of analysis, most of the time we really are talking about patients or individuals, maybe animals if we're doing an animal study. Um, but there are also times where the unit of analysis may be a group like a school or a classroom or a clinic. When we say record, we mean one instance of this unit, one patient, one respondent, um, and typically each patient has all their data in one row. Although there may be reasons why this is not the case. When we talk about a variable, that of course is a factor or a measure of interest in your study, and these tend to be oriented in the columns. Um, and a cell contains the value of a single variable for one patient or respondent. We also wanted to touch on the long versus wide data format. So you can see in this, in this slide how both tables contain the exact same information. We've got um, these test scores. Um, and in this, in the long form data set, they're arranged vertically um, with actually three rows for each student. And we've got an indicator saying which time point they were measured at. Um, and in this data layout, we have that one row per record situation that I was just describing. And we've got the baseline, the midterm, and the final measurements um, as separate variables in the columns. So which data layout do you wanna use? Well, the answer depends on the analyses that you have planned. Um, this long one would be good for kind of um, longitudinal data analysis approaches. But this wide one would let you easily analyze, um, for example, means at the different time points and maybe do like some paired t-tests. So really, this is a good illustration of why um, you should think about how your data is going to be laid out in at the same time that you're thinking about what analysis you have planned. Exactly. Okay, so I did want to talk to you guys about a project actually that came into us, uh, came to our center here at Virginia Tech about a month or so ago, and the PI graciously gave us permission to use this for the purpose of this presentation. Although I do want to note that I did make some modifications, obviously, for educational purposes, and of course, to protect uh, patient uh, information. So the name of this project was the Brachial Plexus Sparing Project. And so this study uh, was a small one, a small study consisting of just 10 patients that were previously treated for um, or with radiation therapy for recurrent breast cancer. So for this study, they were given a second round of treatment and they received proton therapy. And because these patients were being given a repeat therapy in the subclavian area, which if you guys don't know, is kind of this area located right under your clavicle or your collarbone, 
there was a lot of care that was given to spare the brachial plexus. So the brachial plexus, again, kind of a, a short little anatomy <laughs> um, class here, but it's a network of nerves in your shoulder that really um, help to carry movement and sensory signals from your spine uh, so your spinal cord to your arms and your hands. So if this area is to be damaged, whether it's through an injury or in this case for these patients through um, radiation therapy, the patient could lose function in their arms and their hands. So there is a lot of care of trying to uh, maintain function in these patients. So for each, uh, each patient's treatment, of course, was individualized uh, by a number of factors. And so the dose that was delivered to um, the brachial plexus during the first treatment, as well as in this second round, really depended on the, the disease severity, as well as the regions that were treated. Of course, not each individual um, patient was treated in the same areas, of course. And of course, the risk tolerance of the patient themselves. So some patients might say, you know, do whatever needs to be done. Um, so the dose that's given to them in that brachial plexus area might be slightly higher um, than, for example, another patient that, um, for example, scoops ice cream with her treated arm for a living and would want to preserve function. So there is a, quite a little bit of variability in the data set in here. And so here are just some images to help you all visualize what's going on here. So on the left here, you can see kind of like in a, if you were directly looking at a person, you'll see the brachial um, plexus here is kind of this little network of nerves and then your subclavian area is here. And so um, on the right, you'll see uh, it's just another view from a scan uh, where the patient is lying down. So you can see the spine is where this little um, green plus is here. Genevieve, if you can put over the your cursor over the area. Oops. Oh, apparently you can't. <laughs> That's okay. You see my cursor? I'm I'm circling the green area. I'm not sure if I oh, see I it. Over. That's why. Okay. Okay, there we go. That's the spinal area. And then of course the the brachial plexus is around here around about the shoulder. So the clavian is there just so that you all can sort of visualize the areas that are being treated. So something important to consider here is study design, right? So patients were given protons, uh, proton therapy, and their dose plans uh, were given, dose plans were given to the patient for this particular treatment. And so just so that you're aware, um, photon plans were also drawn up for these same patients. So they did not actually undergo both proton and photon therapy, but there were plans that were drawn up um, for these same patients to match their doses to the brachial plexus and surrounding areas if they were given photons. And so essentially these are paired metrics. Um, they're also repeated measures of dose levels um, that cover the percent of target volume in a certain area. So again, there's no need to get into the nitty gritty of, of what this is, but essentially I do want to point out that there are paired metrics. One of them is an actual dose that they were given and that they received. Another is sort of serving as a control of what their doses would have been should they have received another type of therapy. So essentially, the primary research question is the following. So the PI came in and said, I really just want to know, are there differences in the maximum doses between these treatment modalities, these two treatment modalities, in each of these regions, right? So as a biostatistician, I can start to think about the analyses that we might need to be doing here. So I'm thinking about, you know, mixed modeling, if we're wanting to look at all of these doses um, because they are repeated, we have to think about paired metrics too. So we might wanna do like a paired t-test at a specific um, dose coverage level. Um, and so I can already feel things brewing in here. So now let's go ahead and take a look at the data that we received. So here it is. All righty. So, and this is actual um, what the data look like. Of course, I changed the values, of course, to protect patient information. But generally, this is what the data had looked like. So I want to kind of throw out there, and any of you can unmute yourselves or provide in the chat of things that what jumps out to you about this data in particular. Any thoughts? Mm 
no one. There's more than one bit of information in each cell. Yes, that's a, that's a great thing. Thank you, Emmy, <laughs> for jumping in. Yeah, there is more than one bit of information. Can you uh, be specific about what you're what you're thinking about here? Because there are a couple places where that happens. Um. Okay. This was actually Kristen. Oh, Kristen. I'm so sorry. I yeah. Mary Elizabeth. I'm so sorry. Um. So if you look at column B. Yep. Um. There's percentages, axilla, CTV. Mm -hmm. um, you can see photons. I don't know what GY stands for, but it's mm -hmm. non-numeric. So yeah. yeah, those are examples. Great. Okay, great. Thank you. All righty. Anybody else before we move on? These are great things. Thank you, Kristen. All right. Great things to point out. There are other things that we'll dive into later on. And so here's also a close up of the data so you could see it in, in, in its entirety. And so this is just, you know, just a few couple of records, but you can notice here that the subjects, um, oh, there are some things in the chat. Thank you guys. Let's see. So mix notation on a lowercase na versus na. There's spaces in some areas, blank rows. Thank you. Thank you, Kate. These are all great things. So you can see here, there's a whole bunch of things going on in here, uh, including these things that you mentioned a little bit more, which we'll dive into in just a little bit. All right, so before we get back into that specific example, um, I just wanted to talk a little bit about how software is reading data. Um, so I've been teaching fast programming for several years now, and I always think it helps to have the students understand how is the software thinking and what is it actually doing? Um, so statistical programming tends to follow some typical conventions, just like any other field. Um, the main one that we've been that we've mentioned already is that each row is a, usually a record and each column is usually a variable. Um, and so really the positioning of the different values within the software has kind of been standardized to make programming easier. I know that um, it can be really hard to learn a new software package or programming language, but these conventions make it a lot easier. Um, I also like to tell um, students that when they're when they're learning that the software is very literal. You are smarter than the software. It will do exactly what you tell it to. And so um, whether that's the correct thing or not. So you need to understand how it's how it's how it's thinking and how it's working. Um, yeah, so practically when you're doing a function like calculating a mean where doing this on a column and so that's one of the main reasons why we like to keep our variables in columns and then a more complex function like regression is um it's 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 doing the same thing just more complex and so it is considering the arrangement of the rows and the columns um, and integrating that information so here is um some example syntax just to just to give you an idea so on the left we've got the sas code and on the right, we've got some R code that are both doing pretty much the exact same thing, which is a we are running a, log a logistic model. Um, you can see both packages expect to be told the name of the data set, um, just kind of in different spots in the code. They expect to be told the name of the column that contains the outcome variable, which I have named outcome for this case. And then also, um, it's also naming the covariates of interest. Um, and you can also see that the model in general is laid out in the same in the same general fashion and it would match like you would see in a statistics textbook or something. And so either of these two sets of code, if you were to run them, it would do the same thing and fit a logistic regression model. So this brings us to best practice number two, which is to put all of your variable names in the first row of your data. And we also suggest keeping these variable names short and meaningful. The reason why is you're gonna to have to type them um, or write them into your code multiple times. And so you should make it easy on yourself. Um, the software packages also tend to alter long variable names in kind of unpleasant ways that will not be fun to type more than once. <laughs> um, SAS has a habit of truncating variable names that are too long. It'll take these, uh, special characters and like turn them into an underscore. Um, 
it could generate an error message or overwrite something if it if the variable name starts with a number. Sometimes SAS will just like default to if it really can't read something, it'll name it something unhelpful like variable 23. R sometimes adds these weird little back ticks, quotation marks, um, and has um, length limits. So um, this is going to help you out when you're writing your code to follow this convention. The next one, as some of you have already noted um, in, in our example data, um, is to keep your th keep things numeric. Um, variable names should be characters, but the data values itself should be numbers when possible. It's okay sometimes to use a character or string, string variable, um, but it might just be easier on yourself not to do that. Um, and also, it's a good idea to keep the maximum amount of information possible in your raw data, because you can always modify it later using code. For example, if you were going to um, categorize age into age groupings, um, this uh, you would want to do this in your code, because you can always, um, first of all, have a record of what you've done, and you can always back it out. Like, what if you do want to go back to that continuous age variable at some time? Because you always know that in six months or 12 months, a reviewer is going to ask you a question. <laughs> and so you'll want to refer back to your code to know exactly what you did. Here's another good one that um, I think it was Kristen mentioned earlier, a one variable per column. So if you've got a blood pressure, put the systolic in one column, the diastolic in another. Um, if you have a height, keep the feet in one column and in the inches in another, or better yet convert it all to the same unit. Um, if you have comments or clinical notes, these should go in a separate column. Um, and so if you're thinking about keeping your analysis in mind, the reason why for this is that those, those numeric functions that you're going to be doing um, are requ require all your data to be in the same units and made of numbers. And so um, if SAS or R tries to take a mean on some character variables, you're just gonna get an error message. So, um, but if you but if you keep things keep one variable per column in numeric, you can avoid this problem. Next up is consistency. So it's always easier um, to do your analyses. For example, if you're calculating a BMI, if you know the units, um, keep the you know use the same date format for dates use the same letters or words for character or string variables. Um, that'll, that'll make it easier on yourself when you're making your table one and when you're doing, when you're even just for data cleaning, less, less cleaning when you've got consistent data. Um, another thing that I'll mention for those of you that kind of are more subject matter experts, sometimes the statistician or the person analyzing the data doesn't always, isn't always familiar with the units. So it's nice to put those um, to put those maybe in the name of the variable. Myself, I always forget how many grams does a mouse weigh. Um, I don't really know all the units for particular lab values. Like some sometimes it's an amount per milliliter. Um, if it's a birth weight for a for a baby, for example, um, I'd be able to tell. Okay, it's grams if it's thirty two hundred, but if it's three point two, it's probably kilograms. But it just helps everyone out um, to keep the the units consistent and um, and just have it be clear in your data set. And and if multiple people are entering entering the data, it helps to have everyone follow the same rules and conventions. All right, let's talk about missing data for a second. Missing data is a fact of life, but we try to avoid it as much as we can. Um, if there is missing data, it helps to really be clear about how it's represented because it has implications for your research project and for the analysis. So when you're thinking about the research itself, you might wonder, well, why is this data missing? It could be that the data was not applicable for that particular subject or respondent. It could be that the, it wasn't measured or they were not asked the question, or maybe the respondent refused to answer the question. Um, another one that I've seen come up is if there has been an assay and the, the level is below detection. Well, 
what does that mean? Does that mean we can call it a zero? Does that mean it wasn't there? Does that mean that um, there was an error in the in the in the lab equipment? Um, the, oops, sorry. The more information, the better. Um, and then some of this just for coding and programming to think about. Um, Kristen or Kate mentioned the NAs. Um, we like to avoid having those in a numeric column because they can cause the data to be read in incorrectly. Um, some, sometimes people use 999 to indicate missing or maybe another numeric code that is like obviously not a real data value, but still tells, um, it tells us something like it's missing and maybe why it's missing. Mm -hmm. All right, we're gonna take a look at our data yeah. example and um, some of the specific things in there. Yeah, thank you. So uh, Genevieve went over some key things here over the last few slides. And so the very first thing is that it, in this data set, the first row does not include our variable names. So instead, we're finding these variable names in the first column, right? So we see in column A, subject ID, modality, and then we also see region and measure. And so um, if you were to try to import this information, what it what would happen, right? The variable names would be subject ID, the next one in column B is blank, and then we have it numbered essentially one through 10, but also noting that these are merged cells, right? So the way that this would be read in, you would probably run into a number of errors there. Um, the next thing here, a couple things actually, that this data does not keep the values numeric as you guys have, have noticed. And so we can see the units of measure actually in here in these columns, right? So GY is actually short for gray, and that is a unit that is uh, measured, used to measure radiation doses. And so you can see in, um, al also that there are areas where the units are included, other places where they're not. So consistency in here is also an issue, right? So uh, Kate also brought up, for example, that you know in some areas, missing missingness is captured as na with a capital n uh, capital a maybe n slash a lowercase nt and then in other places is blank right and so a lot of uh, inconsistency there as well also as uh, kristen pointed out is that column b contains information for more than one variable that is we can see the region and the dose metric so, uh, for example, the CTV axilla three, that's the region on the left side um, of the patient. And then the D 100%, for example, is the dose level that's covering essentially 100% of the target volume. So these would need to be separated out um, as their own separate columns. Um, another thing to note here, um, which is, is the color, right? You can tell from the coloring here, and I know a lot of people tend to do this, is that they'll highlight things. And I remember going to the PI and asking, you know, how am I supposed to treat this missing data? You know, once I was trying to reformat it, understanding what her question was, um, I'm like, is there a difference between NA, NT, blanks? And they're like, oh no, that's why we colored them gray, right? And so for them, uh, coloring them gray indicated, I don't want you to look at those. So color is also something that they used in here to try and um, help us when in fact when we try to import this the color unfortunately doesn't come through right so this would be something that you would need to create some sort of indicator of you know i want to include this this um value versus not um, and of course in also going back to missing data that it might be missing for different reasons and in this case it was missing maybe because the the patient wasn't treated in that area or maybe it was because um you know, the data was faulty, but there is no distinction in, in this data set. Um, and so having to go back to the to the PI to ask those questions also does take some time, a little bit of going back and forth to try and figure that out, but um, just some things to, to point out. All right, let's talk about the data dictionary. It is so important, especially if you've worked with survey data, you'll, you'll know how important it is to have a data dictionary. It's kind of be the key for all of your shorthands. Um, and so we can see over here, we've got ones and zeros. These are pretty common um, conventions that we that we often use, whether where the zero means no or 
maybe placebo and the one means yes or treatment. Um, but some of them are a little bit more harder to figure out. And so I've, I've put some uh, cardiovascular related um, acronyms here. It's always good to clarify those, especially if the statistician is not as familiar with the subject matter yet. Um, so the CDC is really great about data dictionaries and um, and and note and uh, documentation. And so if you've ever worked with PRAMS, which is a stands for Pregnancy Risk Assessment and Monitoring System, um, or there's a couple of other surveys, NHANES, Burfus, um, these often these always come with really good online documentation and they'll be provided with you to you when you got the data request. Um, so I'm actually gonna show you an example straight off of the PRAMS data dictionary. So here we've got um, in these two examples, the first one is about, it's asking women if they have felt depressed since birth. And so we've got the variable name for the actual SAS variable over here. Um, these numbers are what, how the data is coded. And then over here we have, what does it mean? So in this case, five means never, one means always. Um, and then we've got, you know, we can see that it's kind of an ordinal scale. Um, and then for this one, we've got the maternal age grouping. Um, so this is the, the actual variable that you would type into your SAS code. This is kind of a short label for what it means. And then over here on this side, we've got numbers again, but they mean different things in, than they did for this variable. So we've got the age groupings. Um, and I know sometimes with, like, I know earlier we told you we like to have the whole continuous variable when we can, but a lot of times these surveys do the groupings in the raw data to help protect the privacy of the respondents. So these are really good examples of how you could format or structure a data dictionary if you're kind of building your own database. Um, and another thing I'll just mention is that PRAMS, for example, has their analytical data dictionary that talks about how to do the coding itself, but you can also get the whole survey with the questions and the entire wording of the question. And so that could be helpful to you when you're actually doing the study design part um, to choose the questions that, the survey questions that answer the research question that you're thinking about. So you can either get these for secondary data analyses or you can make them yourself for your own data. All right, next we'll talk about PHI. Um, let's see. So things that you definitely want to remove before you share this data is the names and addresses, um, the MRNs, the social security numbers, these kinds of things are definitely not needed for analysis. And so just, you know, please just exclude them. Um, sometimes you do need a HIPAA identifier to, to help with the data analysis. And so an example of that might be like the birth date, the date of diagnosis, the date of a procedure. So dates are, are technically considered to be um, to be PHI. Um, and so for this reason, we always recommend don't consider data to be fully de-identified unless you're really sure that it's de-identified and always use be aware of your institution's um, data security and data um, privacy regulations. So I put some links here for each of our iThrive partner institutions that can help you find um, find that information. Um, things that, that are covered in there. I know at UVA, we're not supposed to use Box or Dropbox for data depending on its security level. Um, we avoid keeping things on hard drives or USB drives. We avoid sending things via email. Um, the best practice I think is to have a secure shared storage space where people who are on the IRB protocol can all have access to the data and it stays there. You can analyze it from there. Um, when in doubt, store your data more securely than you think is necessary because you don't want to kind of go the opposite direction. All right. So we're going to talk again about our brachial plexus example. Yes. So now that we've sort of gone through most and not all of the best practices here, the data, this data is clearly not in the best format to answer our primary research question, which in fact was, um, Jenny, if you can go to the next. Yes, one. yes. 
So the primary research question was, are there differences in maximum doses between the two treatment modalities? And again, um, recalling that these are essentially repeated measures. There's also pairing that's occurring in here. I'm thinking, you know, get, and given all of the best practices that we've discussed so far, along with the methodology that we want to use. So in this case, I'm thinking mixed modeling to account for repeated measures in each subject. And the fact that there are paired metrics would be appropriate here. And so the program that I'm using, so I'm thinking of using SAS um, to do this, um, my, it will require my data to look like this. So this is a long data set, right? And I think Genevieve had touched upon this at the very beginning. So we can see here that the variable names here are all in the first row. All of the variables have been separated. So before region and the dose metric were in the same column, right? These have now been separated. You can see here also in column E for dose GY, I've included the unit. So it's a descriptive variable. It's not just dose. I also provided the unit in the name. And also all of these values have dropped the um, the units, no worries, have dropped the units and they're all numeric. I've also included the modality. So again, there are repeated measures here for each, essentially each dose metric, there are two values for each um, participant and then several. So these are all of the records that we would include for patient ID. Of course, this is truncated data, there's far more in here that we would want to, to show, but this is essentially coming from, uh, and Genevieve, can you actually go back, from this initial data set where you have colors, where you have merged cells, where you have, you know, no variable names at the, at the very beginning. Again, it's the thought process that goes behind it of thinking about your research question, your analytic um, approach, and tying that all into how you're going to set up your data set. And this is, we got the before and the after. Yes. So um, as you can recall, and I'm sure that you guys noted, is that that data that we received for that brachial plexus project was actually collected and entered via Excel. And again, there were several people on that team um, that provided us the data that actually worked together and I think might be the issue in terms of the, the inconsistencies that we saw. And so I just wanted to point out that Excel is, you know, great at what it does. It's probably the first thing that you think about in terms of like, I need to collect data. Okay, let's do it in Excel. Um, unfortunately, Excel is not a data management package. It's also not a statistical package. Again, it's good at what it does in terms of, you know, storing information, but it is not great at doing statistics or managing data at all. So the ideal tool that we want to recommend for data collection would be REDCap. And so REDCap is um, an online tool um, that you can use. And I know all of our, um, I think all of our sites have access to REDCap. And so if you haven't heard of REDCap already and you are um, a student, a research assistant or a faculty member, you would certainly get free access to REDCap um, and uh, it has a red cap, of course, has several advantages, including being HIPAA compliant. And so it can store sensitive information and can de identify data in just a matter of a few clicks. Um, it's also flexible in that you can create data entry projects, you know, just as this project was probably put together as a sort of data entry project in Excel. Um, you can also create surveys um, and also capture repeated measures or events in a nice way. Um, there's also modules for uh, double data entry. And the great thing about it is that you, know, you can store this data, it's in a safe place. It is also combat compatible with a lot of these major, major statistical softwares. So that's SAS, that's R, there's um, Stata, there's XML versions of here um, that, that are compatible, as well as allowing for API. So API uh, stands for Application Programming Interface, and really it's just a way that you can um, automatically extract data from your server. So once you have it all set up, you won't have to download data each time that you have new information. 
right? So it would just be something that you would read into your code. And each time you run a line of code, it would essentially update your data set every time, which is really nice, super efficient. And it's something that um, we have actually started um, implementing into our own center. Um, other advantages is that there are great quality checks. You get cleaner data, nicer reports. And although, you know, REDCap does have does has its it has its limitations you know it's not perfect in every way i was actually um talking to someone earlier this week about you know uh the matrix fields for example how they're not allowed to be text fields or you know the slider options are not that great but there are um you know benefits in terms of being hipaa compliant and you know all of these other advantages listed here so, and I know that I haven't said anything about Qualtrics, which is also a great tool to use, but I am not highlighting it here today because of the fact that it is not always HIPAA compliant. And so it's not always your best option for storing non-sensitive information. And as Genevieve was saying, you always wanna prepare, you know, and, and, and be more secure than what you need your data to be. And so um, Qualtrics, again, only I believe if you buy a premium version, uh, you would have to buy it for buy that to be um, HIPAA compliant. So it's not automatically um, going to be HIPAA compliant. So you would always want to check that before you start storing sensitive information. If you're dealing with non-sensitive information, then that is okay. You won't have to worry about HIPAA compliance. But otherwise, um, I just ask that you all be careful as as you're entering your data, but as far as the advantages of REDCap over something like Excel, I mean, you can't beat um, data security in the sense that, you know, anyone, if your laptop is to be stolen, et cetera, you might, um, you know, anybody can access that data. Whereas in REDCap, it, you would have to log in. There are only certain users or people that can use um, or view the data or make edits to it. You can also look at activity logs to see, you know, what data has been changed and know exactly who made the changes when they made it. These are time stamped. So it is far more secure in that way. Something that you wouldn't be able to, to do or capture if you're working in Excel or if you're using something like Google Sheets, which you can look at the log, but again, is something that is not nearly as secure as something like REDCap. And on this slide are just a couple of resources for REDCap, including our iThrive portal, where you can find someone from any of our iThrive sites to support you um, as you are building your databases, um, whether it's in REDCap or even if you're doing something in Qualtrics. Or I know that in at Virginia Tech, we're kind of shifting away from Qualtrics into this new, um, new uh, what is it called? It's called Question Pro. And so, you can definitely uh, reach out to any of us if you are building a database and so there's that link there to connect you with someone um, at iThrive and also available for REDCap are online training videos from uh, Vanderbilt University and so these are actually really helpful Vel Vanderbilt um, University these folks are the ones that created REDCap so they have amazing tools and training videos available on their website Oops. Mm -hmm. Our last best practice is you can always check with a statistician as you have got your, your data collection tools set up. Um, I definitely recommend this if you are, if, if a statistician is going to be performing the analyses. Um, you know, we, we, Alicia and I both have a, a lot of experience by now, and so we know what to look for. Um, we can help you not only think through the study design, but also to just get your spreadsheet set up the way that that will be, or your red cap will be most effective for your high quality research. Um, and this will save everybody time and get hopefully to a really great product. Um, and I also just want to mention, you can come to our drop in consulting hours. Um, each of our sites now has um, some mechanism for just kind of quick questions that you can stop in, ask a statistician, we can, we'll be happy to help you out. Um, and those, that information is available on the beginning slide, one of the beginning slides from this talk, and also you can find it easily on the iThrive portal.
And at this point, we would like to open the floor for some questions. So if there's anything we didn't talk about or you want to clarify, um, let us know. Now's the time. You can put it in the chat or unmute yourself, however you prefer. No questions. Well, if there's no questions, then it's time for the quiz. <laughs> yeah, we have a quiz. <laughs> All can right. I ask a quick, can yeah. I ask one question first? Yeah, um, sure. it's pretty like red cap specific, I would say, as far yeah. as like, yeah, dealing with the database stuff. So I think like I've I've just started using red cap for the first time, like with some of our current projects. And one of the challenges that I have in setting them up is like actually figuring out like what nomenclature I really need to use on the front end so that statisticians on the back end can actually like know what data we're collecting. Because one of the problems, one of the challenges that we have is that we have multiple different instruments and we're collecting like the same, sometimes it's basically the same variable multiple times. Mm -hmm. And so I'm wondering like, is it is it beneficial to, like, can we use basically the same variable name ish? I mean, I don't think you can use the exact same name in, in a, a red cap project, but like, is it always going to be associated with the instrument? So it's okay if it like, if it's more or less the same name used across instruments, does that make sense? I, yes. And I, I, and I know what you're talking about because I'm familiar with the work that you do. Mary yeah. So, um, I, these are great, great questions. And so as far as um, the instruments themselves, if you have several instruments that you're collecting from, what I always try to do in the variable names, and again, we were talking about this earlier about making your variable names as descriptive as possible. And I know that it's also a challenge to try and stay within a certain limit as well. But what you wanna do is of course, provide the name of the instrument at the beginning of that variable. So, you know, it's from this instrument and then you can have some sort of other descriptive label um, to help, you know, identify it's from this instrument. This is the variable that I'm referring to. If it's the same type of variable, which I think is what you're getting at here at different time points. Again, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm thinking about how your red cap is set up. If you have um, the structure, the underlying structure of your um, of your database if it includes the repeated instances or events mm -hmm. in here. It does. It, yeah. If it does, then you should be able, the statistician when they download the data or they're you know, getting it through API, there should be a column that's called red cap underscore event underscore name. This is automatically mm -hmm. generated. That would let you know that these are uh, repeated over time. And so that should be already built into red cap itself. But as far as, um going also going back to the the question that you had about how do i let my statistician know you know how the how my data is structured right mm -hmm. it's going back to the actual design of your study and i think uh meeting with your statistician making sure that you cover all of these bases these are when these assessments were taken right this is mm -hmm. where we're going to expect to see data and clarifying exactly what that is so that we can really understand you know what the study design is and where we're expecting to see data when we're expecting it and also when we're not expecting it so if it's an instrument that you collected for example at baseline but didn't collect you know at follow-up times we would expect mm -hmm. to see that and so i always like to provide um create like a little table maybe of when your assessments were captured and this is something that we can refer to very similar to the data dictionary where you can, you know, you have your codes for your data, which REDCap, if you guys didn't know, also provides a nice data dictionary or a code book for you already. And so it's a built in process that you don't have to do yourself. But I think a supplemental documentation in terms of um, what the study design is, what the assessments are, and when, you know, you expect them to be captured will really help us kind of paint that full picture and will, uh, will also help us in in trying to think about what methodology is appropriate for us to use when analyzing mm -hmm. it. I hope that helps. Does that answer your question? Yeah, yeah, that does. Yeah, it was, yeah, definitely. Thank you. <laughs> Great question. Yeah. Um, I have a question. Um, 
So like on the statistician side, um, I have a quick, like, what are your recommendations for like any intermediate intermediate um, data set that like kind of like have some kind of transformation from the raw data set provided by the collaborator? For example, like, um, like if I need to do some log transformation on a variable or um, like grouping of continuous variable into categorical variable. So how how um, how would you recommend storing those information? Um, you know, that's a good question. I, so yeah, I, I think my suggestion would be to um, would be to do those modifications using statistical software in, in in code so that you can have a record of exactly what was done. Especially, yeah, for categorical grouping. Um, so definitely keep keep everything, don't get rid of anything. Um, so let's say you've got your continuous variable that you want to do the grouping on, create a new variable. So you still keep the continuous one, you've created a new variable that has the grouping and do that via code of some kind um, so that it can be, so that you, so you can refer back to it later. And you know if you make a mistake, you can fix it, or maybe you need a different categorization set up. Um, I've had all those things happen to me at, on various projects. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Um, yeah. And then I guess like also like in terms of like communicating with the collaborators as um, like when we need to like move that data set back to the collaborator in case they want to do some kind of visualization or exploration on them all. So would that can be done through REDCap? So in terms of like storing back that data set back to REDCap or it had to be from kind of like to other source. Yes, that's a great question. So in REDCap, uh, you can also import data. So if you have something in like an Excel or CSV format, you can certainly upload that information into REDCap. So you're not having to, you know, create a project and then manually enter it. There are ways for you to automatically import that information and then share it with your team in that way as well. Um, so there are options there, but you can also, I mean, through the other ways, if you had some sort of shared drive or, you know, some sort of sort of shared space that you share with your team or your collaborators, that is also an option there as well, if you want to stay away from REDCap. Um, but yes, it is an option. You can certainly import data, um, external data into REDCap very easily. Cool, thanks. Yeah, so what I'm hearing is that to make sure that the code, start a code with like in a reproducible way and then um, like have a way to keep the communication in terms of like the, the data store in between the collaborators. Exactly. Cool. Thank you so much. Yeah. And I'll just add one thing, which is our next seminar next month is going to talk about a specific tool that can help you with, with can help you with that. And so our markdown, if you use that, you can, it saves your code, it helps you make a nice reproducible report, and you can um, kind of, it helps you avoid version control issues. So if you're interested, check that one out next month. Yeah, thank you. you. I was gonna, this is Jen, um, which I was in as Kate Miller earlier. I don't know why that was my name. <laughs> oh my goodness, and I was messaging Kate Miller. <laughs> <laughs> when you said Kate, I was like, wait, what? Am I? And I was like, oh, I, I somehow I clicked the link on my calendar and I'm Kate today. Um, so, Funny. But I, but, okay. yeah, I, I can't live up to, to her uh, <laughs> work ethic and uh, organization there. So, um, but, but anyway, um, I just wanted to let you know, I'm going to paste the uh, link to an article um, in the chat that's in the American Statistician and it's data organization and spreadsheets. Yes. And, you know, this is the article that I wish I had written in 1998 if I'd known I could get published in the American Statistician <laughs> or yes. something like this. Um, but it is a really great article for practitioners. Even though we're not talking about spreadsheets, we're talking about REDCap, it, it echoes a lot of the same principles that you all talked about um, through, throughout this. And so I think it's a good one um, for folks to, to look at and kind of... Um, read through and think about how they name their variables, how they organize their data, get a little more info on the data dictionary and things like that. So I would just think it, it, it's a good read. It's an easy read. So 
Yes, and, and it's actually something that we implement in our own center. Like that is how we set up our data guidance document. So thank you, Jen, for sharing that in the in the chat. You're welcome. Well, we are just about at time. So thank you all for participating and asking great questions. And we will make this recording available. So if you have a colleague or someone that wants to um, to know what we talked about, they'll be able to find it out. All right. And we'll send you a survey by, by email later. So if you liked us, please respond to the survey. <laughs> Thank you, everyone. Thank you.